Our first uh, presenter tonight will be Bruce Zaretsky. Uh, he's our landscape consultant. Uh, he's a, a, a known expert in the area. He's actually done the designs for the um, butterfly garden at the um, Strong Museum. Thank you. Sorry. Um, after Bruce, I'll get up and, and share. We've done a municipal uh, rain garden here at the town. Uh, we wanted to, to test it out first before we kind of recommend other people do it. Uh, we received a grant uh, several years ago to put that in. So we put it at the highway garage, figuring, um, you know, if it can survive there, the salts and oils and everything else, then uh, it can survive pretty much anywhere else. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Bruce Zaretsky. Uh, people are sometimes uh, surprised to know that in the Rochester area, we get 36 inches of precipitation a year. And half the people say, wow, that's a lot. And half the people say, wow, that's nothing. Because they think that we get eight feet of snow. But when eight feet of snow melts down, it's about 10, 11 inches of actual water precipitation. So we get in this area about 35 inches of rain a year. And we're blessed when you, can, when you compare us to other areas of the country. We, we live near a very large body of fresh water, and we get a lot of fresh water falling out of the sky. If you start thinking about what that water does when it falls on your property, though, this is a, a fairly simple calculation, thinking about a half-acre property with a, a 3,000 square foot colonial house, which would be a 1,500 square foot roof, and maybe a 60 foot driveway. You do all the calculations, and in one year, with 35 inches of precipitation, 52,000 gallons of water are running off your roof and off your driveway, not including your lawn, not including your patio, just those two surfaces. You start adding that up to say 30 or 40 houses in your neighborhood, and you're dumping a million and a half gallons of water that is coming off your roof and off your driveway and down into the storm sewers. It has to go somewhere. The general theme, when, when a house is built, or if you look at your house, you have a number of ways where a number of ways water are, are brought off your property. Uh, storm water typically goes into a storm water sewer. In most cases, it'll be a separate it'll be a separate line that goes into a storm water right there, and then you'll have your sanitary, which is your toilet, your sinks your uh, washing machine, your shower, go into a secondary sewer called a sanitary sewer. So in general, there are two uh, systems of removing water from your property. Now, when you start thinking about it, traditionally big cities, New York City, LA, Rochester, Chicago, uh, all have what are com called combined sewer systems. And this is where we really start thinking about what we're doing with our stormwater. Combined st sewer systems are both sanitary and storm water go to a water treatment plant. So when it rains or when you flush your toilets, it all goes to the same place and is treated in a plant. But they all have overflow protection. If we get a one inch rainfall in New York City, um, it shuts the valves going to the water treatment plant and everything goes off into the East River, the Harlem River, the Hudson River. And that's not just storm water, that's raw sewage as well. So combined systems are not such a good thing. And the way to help alleviate the the load on a combined system is to try to alleviate the load coming down when it rains, when we get these heavy downpours, these one inch, two inch downpours in a few hours. Now, this doesn't happen in Penfield, it's a whole different animal, but in the big cities, any big city you can think of in the country, that's how they operate. Like a glacier, when water is sheeting down your driveway or down your street or off your roof, it's picking up everything in its, in its path and carrying it along, just like a glacier would. And there are things like salt, obviously, our roads are salted here. But you put oil in your car, you spill a little bit. You put gasoline in your lawnmower, you spill a little bit. Um, anything else, antifreezes, wood varnishes, name it. Any kind of toxic chemical that you are using that you spill a little bit onto your driveway, and it's going to be running down into the storm sewers. Other things that run off, and this is where people in my industry are very guilty. Now, I, I will preface this by saying I don't fertilize, but um, com homeowners and commercial buildings use 10% more pesticides than farmers do. 67 million pounds of pesticides are used every year commercially. That means when, when Chemlon comes to your house, that's putting pesticides down. 5 to 10% of wells show pesticide infiltration and it's poisoning 60 to 70 million birds a year. They run through the sewers, down the storm culverts, everywhere. This is stuff, you know, you have your lawn fertilizer, you have your lawn pesticide treated, and then that night we get a thunderstorm, and it runs off, and it's running off down the street and into, the, um, into our waterways, and it kills fish. That's a fish kill, 
and that's string algae, and that happens regularly. Uh, whenever we have a, a big heavy downpour or when we have just areas that are not handling the storm water properly. What's the alternative? Excuse me? What's the alternative? What's the alternative? That's what we're talking about right now. The alternative is to, is to do things like rain gardens and man-made wetlands, and I'll, I'll show you what we do. So that is not a stage picture. That's a fish kill due to pesticides. Where was that? I don't know, have the answer to that question. So how do we keep pesticides out of, the wa out of uh, our waterways? And this, uh, let's go back a second. This says, keep it clean, runs to the river. And you're starting to see this a lot in a lot of municipalities. You'll see near the storm sewers that this water is running to the river. So please don't dump your oil, your waste car oil. Don't, please don't dump things into the water. So we could ask nicely and everybody would say, yeah, no problem. We're into this. And when you guys leave here tonight, you're going to be you're going to say, yeah, I'm totally into it. But then, you know, your car blows a leak somewhere and the water runs off into the parking lot. And these are things that happen every day. So how do we keep this stuff out of our storm sewers? We do it by eliminating storm sewers. Uh, Mark and uh, Jeff, when he comes, and, and Tony can, can vouch that every builder that, that puts a, uh, a plan into the town, I'm always making comments about the storm, sewer, the storm drainage. And can't we do bioswales and can't we do rain gardens? rather than putting everything into storm sewers. And yes, we can. A rain garden is the best way to handle storm water flow, especially in a residential situation on your own properties. What they do is they will minimize or eliminate any water going into the storm sewers. Now a rain garden and a, the way a rain garden is constructed, and I'll show you a picture in just a second, there is a pipe in there that is going to run eventually to a storm sewer or to a day, what we call daylighting, which means it just goes out into a drainage swale or something like that. But what you're doing is you're slowing the water down and possibly eliminating any flow into the storm sewers. Uh, it perks the water back into the ground. It, more importantly, it removes pollutants. A two-inch layer of mulch will remove heavy metals from water running into that garden. And that's a big deal when you start all the things that are coming off just in our environment. And obviously, they beautify the environment, and I'm biased in that, in that point, but they do. And in fact, it's a man-made wetlands. Now, a general theme of a rain garden, it's a, just a depression that is filled with a, what we call a rain garden soil mix. And basically it's a sandy soil mix, so water will perk down through it. Then we put some good topsoil in there and we plant plants that, this is gonna sound like an oxymoron, but we plant plants that can handle drought and handle inundation with water. And it's in general, if you drive around our local area and look at any empty piece of land that might be slightly damp where you see like cattails or things growing, look at what's growing in there. In our area, red twig dogwoods and asters and goldenrods and witch hazels and summer sweets and, um, and thistles and things like that. These are plants that can handle this type of environment. And these are the plants that you will use on your list as well, but you will use in a rain garden like this. So we have water kind of running into the garden. And I have another graphics uh, a little down the line here showing a pipe that runs out of them as well. And that pipe is kind of either an overflow pipe or it's where the excess water goes and runs through. And Mark has a great example to show you later how that water uh, turns out when it runs through. Rain gardens, they significantly cut down on the amount of pollution reading, reaching creeks and streams. This is really big. Does anybody here read the New York Times? Okay, well, you're gonna see something uh, in just a second, but between 1930 and 2005, 1,800 square miles of wetlands were removed in New Orleans. Now, that was not just due to dredging to open up the, the, the uh, harbor to get the big ships in, and it's not just due to the oil companies drilling and making a mess down there, but a big reason for that is that uh, to prevent the Mississippi rubber, uh, River from flooding seasonally, a lot of dams and levees were built. And what they did is they stopped the river from flooding. When the river flooded, it brought sediment down and created barrier islands throughout all south of New Orleans. And what those barrier islands and wetlands do is they protect against storm surges. On a smaller scale, here in town, if you see a wetlands, like Thousand Acre Swamp is a great example, that is controlling flooding in the town. It's controlling flooding in the area. Now, you look at a town like, like New Orleans, where they lost 18,000 square miles, and then this happened. 
and then this happened. And this was due to wetlands and, by, and uh, um, barrier islands being either destroyed, removed, or not being able to be rebuilt due to man's infiltration on the site. 40 square miles more were lost. So on a smaller scale, you have a yard flooding. You look at, you go down to uh, Panorama Plaza and we have a 100 year storm. And our 100 year storms seem to be coming every five years now, too, so. So this is the cover of the New York Times Magazine from yesterday. I was shocked when it showed up yesterday morning and I said, wow, look at this, perfect. Every hour, an acre of Louisiana is lost due to storm surge from water surge due to the lack of wetlands and the lack of barrier islands. Every hour, one acre. Mississippi River is not allowed to flood anymore down there. The levees and the dams stop it from doing it, so it can't bring its sediment down. So, okay, that's, that's my, my speech. Now we'll talk about why don't we build our own mini wetlands? Well, we can. This is a bioretention swale or a rain garden along the side of a parking lot. You see no um, storm sewers, no catch basins. The water sheets off the parking lot into that central area and is absorbed into the ground, into the garden. Very, very simple. It's so simple to me. It's, I, I tell developers it's a no-brainer, and they, they, a lot of times they say to me, well, you know, we don't want to spend the money doing it. But honestly, we've done the calculations, and it's cheaper to do it this way than it is to put a bunch of piping in below the parking lots. So here's... Say again? Well, um, I'll keep that comment. I won't, I won't respond to that. So what you're looking at, again, with a cross-section of a rain garden, typically there's some kind of drainage material. What I would call this down here is a French drain. A French drain is a perforated pipe surrounded with stone. We use it to solve drainage problems on properties. If you have a wet area on your site and you have no place to go with the water, we dig a trench, we fill it with stone, we put a pipe in there, and we can channel the water away. This is really no different, just on a larger scale. Then we fill it with a, a, a very per, percolating fill, typically a sandy topsoil mix, a sandy low mix. Then we have another area of a little bit better soil, and then we plant. And that's as simple as it is. So if it's an area that's taking a lot of inundation and we think maybe that it can't handle all that water, yes, some of the water is going to go into that pipe and it's going to run off into the local detention pond or daylight down a bioswale or out into a local stream or river. But the single biggest difference is the water that comes out of that pipe. I'm gonna make up a number, and I'm lying about the number. It's a million times cleaner. And one of these days, we're gonna have uh, a local college student do a test for us on something that Mark and Jeff are gonna show you in a minute. Okay, so it's a great concept, right? You think it's a good concept? And so the first question everybody always says is, yeah, it's a great concept, but who's doing it? Well, large, large cities are doing it, KC. Green Solutions Program. They have bioretention swales and rain gardens right along their streets. They weren't, they weren't the first to do it. Seattle was the first to do it. Portland, Oregon was also one of the first ones. You see the curb cut right here? So the water can run into these bioretention swales along the side of the road. Another good advantage of things like this on really f streets where people drive too fast, you put things like this in them and it's, it's traffic calming. It slows traffic down. People either see a narrower street and it makes them slow down or they see trees and pretty things to look at, and it slows, themselves, slows them down. Seattle, they were the first to do this. They did an experiment on a street two miles, and they did tests on them. And I don't have all those numbers here with me. It's in one of my other talks, but they work. But just trust me that they work. Monroe, Indiana, wherever that may be. <laughs> but again, you see the curb cut in the parking lot, and it just goes in. And eventually that water perks through, sometimes very quickly, sometimes not so quickly, but the plants can handle it. And that's really what we're looking to do here. So when you start thinking about New York, you know, who's doing it in New York? And this is where Mark gets to take over. So as I, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, uh, the town of Penfield, um, you know, thanks to our, our town board, has always wanted to be proactive, getting out there ahead of uh, some of these technologies as we talk about solar, as we talk about other things, you know, let's walk the walk. If we're going to recommend them to our residents, we're going to recommend them to our builders, you know, we ought to kind of put ourselves out there first. So 
Uh, we've uh, put some electric car charging stations. I'll take a two minute segue off that. Uh, we've put in some electric car charging stations. Um, we've put in some solar for pump stations. Uh, we put in some solar at Harris Whalen Park Drives. So we're trying to, you know, you know, getting through grants and some other things, but at least kind of test them out before we recommend them to developers and say, hey, you can do it. So one of the things we did get was a grant through the Stormwater Coalition uh, of Monroe County. There's some handouts from them back there in 2007 was to do a test project. They did one um, at, uh, what's the park off of? Uh, Turning Point Park. Thank you. Uh, Turning Point Park, we did one there to kind of pick up what came off of a parking lot. Uh, it was a new area they were developing. They put the boardwalks along the river. Another spot they wanted to try and said, hey, why don't we do something near a municipal garage? So this project was originally designed for a stormwater pond. A lot of we've seen them at Wegmans. We've seen them other locations. We used to have dry ponds. Back in the day, we used to treat, treat just stormwater quantity. So if you ever looked at Wegmans or some areas, you still have a dry pond. In a storm event, the water flows in, it fills up, storms over, it goes back down. It's just kind of a mowed field area. We kind of moved away from those, moved towards having wet ponds. Now requiring having the water in there as the water flows in, has sediments, gravels in it, hits the, the water, it'll, it slows it down, has a chance for the sediments to settle out, also gives a chance for the plants to absorb the nutrients that are out there. So this project is, uh, you can uh, orient yourself where on Jackson Road is over here. This is the ambulance building on Jackson Road right near the entrance to the Thousand Acre Swamp. The corner you're kind of seeing here is the MAC building and then the town highway garage. So in lieu of putting in a stormwater pond as we normally would, we kind of looked at that and had some constraints starting out. Uh, due to the depth of it, right next to it is a thousand acre swamp. There's not that much depth. Normally you want to have at least four to five feet in a stormwater pond in order to keep clear water. Otherwise, if it's shallower than that, you get a lot of cattails, you get a lot of growth through it, it kind of turns mucky. So not having four to five foot of depth in that area to, from the inlet to the outlet we said, why don't we look at doing a rain garden in this area and, you know, if we can, as I said, handle some of the salts and the oils and the hydraulic fluid and everything that's coming off of the highway trucks, you know, if these plants can survive this, then they must be doing pretty well. Well, behind the new uh, sewer building, if you've been over there, it's a metal, prefab metal building, was an old area that was basically a dumping ground back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. They used to put um, concrete gutter back there, other things that, not garbage, but you know, construction waste, so as they would pull up concrete gutter and everything else, they would get deposited in the back. So you can see the construction of the sewer building, the chunks of concrete that they were digging up already. So we had a little bit of cleanup, so we took some shots ahead of time to kind of show what the area looked like ahead. Uh, this shows the thousand acre swamp limit in the back. So we have kind of a defined area on what we can install it within. And then we also had a pipe that came out of the highway garage area and just kind of dumped here and it was in a field not really going anywhere or being treated at all. So this is the end of the pipe we had to start with. This is the discharge point where we go into the thousand acre swamp. So those are kind of the parameters we had to, to work with. So did our calculations. Uh, we had almost three acres of drainage area, which included the fuel facility, included the, was the AA building, the yellow building that was out there that's no longer there, included part of the salt building. Um, so running our calculation, we looked at uh, doing a total treatment area of uh, 8,400 square feet of area was needed at a, at a depth of six inches. So as, as Bruce talked, and it's kind of hard to see from that. Six inches, um, and this cross section doesn't show up very well and it's better on the things in the back, but you don't want to, to inundate the plants too much. Um, you go from a, a salt tolerance. As a water, as the depth of the water. Yes, yes. This actually would technically qualify as a biofilter. It, yep, so the ponding depth we say is, is six inches. So that was the, the maximum depth that they should be inundated before it goes over a spillway at the far end. So the inlet of our pipe coming in is actually lower than the rim of the catch basin on the outlet end. So every drop of water that comes into the rain garden up to six inches is forced to be percolated down through the soil. And I have some other pictures that shows there are on some under drains down the bottom, as Bruce said, to drain it out so it doesn't sit permanently. Um, but all the water coming in can't, it doesn't, it's not a straight through. As normally you have a pond, it comes in one end, the outlet end, it goes straight out the other end. This has to percolate in, or if it gets in a large storm event, it rises up above that six inches, then there's a catch basin rim and then goes over from there. And with these lights, it's kind of hard to see, but this kind of shows the drainage basin area, shows the fuel islands here, the salt building there, and then the rain garden is over here. Again, that's kind of hard to see, so I'll skip ahead of those slides. Um, but with some of the construction materials, we did um, 
you know, we had the one catch basin at the outlet end. We installed a header pipe at the far end of the, the pond area. I don't know if it's hard to see. You can see it on the TV. Okay, let's back up if we can see the TV. Um, so the, the inlet end, and it's not showing up with a laser pointer in the TV. I don't know why. Uh, so here's the sewer building here. Here's that pipe we saw earlier. Here's the wetland area at the far end. So the discharge comes in, and I hear we have pictures of it. Um, it comes in, we set up a, a weir area in a sediment basin. Knowing we got a lot of you know, um, asphalt, we got rocks and everything else, we didn't want that to plug up our rain garden. So we set up a concrete weir that goes all the way around this. So we're basically creating a bathtub. All that stuff comes in. You wouldn't need to do this for a residential one if you're picking up roof drains, you're picking up stuff off um, your yard. But we know we have a lot of asphalt surface out there. You're gonna have a lot of dirt and everything else that comes off of that. We have an area to collect and it's right next to the parking lot. So every so often the highway department can go out there with the draught, scoop up you know, the sediment that's settled in there, the, the, the stones clean that out, and then keeping the rest of the rain garden clean. So once it comes over that weir, it spreads it out. There are under drains underneath and a header pipe here. This header pipe is set up so that in the future, if we want to, you can see there's another storm pipe on the side, we could expand the rain garden, flip it the other way. So we're looking at, um, we, I think we have two other connection points from the highway department to discharge into the thousand acre swamp. So we're looking at in the future, if we can expand that out, but we do have one catch basin here at the outlet end. So as the water comes in on this end, it has to percolate all the way across or down in, get over to the catch basin before it's discharged into the header pipe or into those two under drains. So this one kind of shows the cross section. So over here would be your inlet pipe, comes in, here's your engineered soil material, your catch basin's at the far end, and then the bottom is the header pipe and then the under drains, and then there's the embankment uh, before it gets discharged out the far end. Sure. Yeah, I'd be glad to share them with you. If you want to either leave your email address or my card is, um, I left my card on the table over there, I can email them to you. So this just kind of details what we did. Again, this is on a large scale. Um, these aren't things you would need to do on a residential level, um, but we did have a catch basin. I can go back to this. We did have some, uh, the header piping that I talked at the end, 12 inches was sized for a future expansion. So it's not necessary to be that large, but figuring if we wanted to expand in the future and flip to the other side and extend that on, we'd make that a little bit larger sized. Uh, we included the wash stone, the perforated under drain, uh, the engineered soil, which I'll show you some pictures of, of what we did and how we actually mixed it. And then Bruce and his crew actually put in uh, all of the plants. Again, large scale equipment for a large scale operation, but we did have dump trucks, um, back hose, uh, the draught, the bobcat and a hydro cedar as part of it. Draught is, it's actually a rubber tired excavator, uh, but Draught was one of the first companies in my understanding that ever made them. So everybody calls it a Draught. Uh, but basically it's a rubber tired excavator and there's a picture in there. Uh, that's a backhoe. The draught is in a picture in the future. So back in 2007, um, after all our planning, we got it approved through Stormwater Coalition. They began the, the excavation. So it was a little bit of an education for a highway department. They're used to either creating a pond or creating something that drains all the way across. Now we're trying to tell them, no, the inlet end is below the outlet end and you need to create a bathtub. So a little bit of conversation with the highway guys, but you know, they were willing to take it on and, and try it out. So basically we created a bathtub as excav excavating the material out, taking out all the, the concrete, the, the uh, extraneous materials, creating this berm around the outside, kind of damming that up, separating it from the thousand acre swamp. Uh, that's uh, Dick Vendel, you know, working in the, in the machine. So at the end of the first week, they started excavating it out. Uh, Here's where that header pipe would go in the future. You can see the other salt building in the background. Here's the area we could expand, kind of getting that down to grade. So after a couple of days, they have the outside berm in. You can see we have our silt fence. This is the black construction silt fence you see in a lot of construction sites to keep you know, runoff from going into the, those areas. And then again, we had a, an inlet pipe and then they put riprap as they know it. You put it at the end so it, it alleviates that flow coming in. Again, it was a little bit of an education process. We're not looking to alleviate, dissipate the flow there. We need to berm this up and make this a, a stone weir at the end of it. So this was kind of a progress one. After a while, we've taken all the stone and kind of made it a weir around this, but you can see the bathtub forming. Again, that's the same pipe we saw at the beginning. Here's the catch basin at the outlet end, showing that header pipe that comes through. One of the under drains comes in here and the other under drains just connect off this header pipe and then it discharges out this way and goes into the the swamp from there. So now we're looking back, here's the Mac building. 
Uh, here's the uh, building that uh, the storage shed there, and then this is the back of the sewer building. So again, our inlet pipe is there. Now you can see they've brought in the under drain rolls, created our bit of a bathtub that's there, using the backhoe uh, to again to start digging those under drain channels, bringing in the stone. Here's the front end loader, so dumping the, the stone into it, and then here's the draught rubber tired excavator. Uh, and the gentleman rolling out, ours came in big long rolls. Again, it's at municipal scale, but they had some under drain underneath it just to drain that out. Here's the pile of our engineered soil mixture. So we basically took sand, I think if it was 50% topsoil, 25% sand, and 25% of leaf mulch uh, that we got from Monroe County. So they took uh, mulch from a lot of leaf collections, ground it up, and then incorporated that in to have those uh, and organics within that help to take out those, those materials and, and uh, filter it through. So you can see as Bruce kind of talked, you know, again, we're starting to, to weir this up in here, and then we started layering in that engineered soil material. So we have our bottom, we have our under drain here. You can see the three under drains in the stone, and then start layering that leaf mulch engineered material over the top. Here it is after it's all layered on. That's actually Bruce walking out, assessing the site before he does his plants. Here's our catch basin at the outlet end with some rip rip protection around it. And again, this catch basin rim is six inches higher than our inlet at the far end. So after we've gone in, Bruce went in, uh, we brought in mulch on top as he talked about having that two inches of mulch to help um, take out those heavy metals. He planted some trees around the top. We hydro seeded the top part of it. And then his crew began the actual planting of it. We decided to, you know, Turning Point Park, they spent a lot of their materials on plants, so they had the immediate impact. Came in with some large scale plants, they put it in, it looked like a, a garden right from the beginning. Obviously a lot of our money, we got the same amount of grant money, went into the piping, the under drain, everything else, so we went uh, with smaller plants. Uh, so we had a lot of the plugs, you know, Bruce bought them in groups with, uh, um, I have a lot of pictures of those coming up as well. Yeah. Bruce is the plant expert. I'll just show you pictures of him, but he'll, he'll tell you exactly, you know, what they all, all are. Uh, but they started planting them in here. Uh, this is what it looked like when it was done. So it didn't look like, well, I'd say, much of a garden at the end of it. Um, but we put a lot of our money in. Now you can see that it's, the stone is, is weird up. So as it comes in, it hits this. This will knock down the, the stone and the sediment here. We don't want to plug up our, our rain garden with all that silt and everything else. We tried to capture it at the beginning end. But you can see we have over the over 800 plants and then the discharge here at the far end. So Bruce's design, um, you know, he can talk more about it, but he's got, you know, sweeps of, of different plants and everything else. So we did a, a large mix of them, knowing that some would survive, some wouldn't survive, some would be better with the salt, some would not be better with the salt. Um, so we tried a, a variety of them. It seems like the grasses have done well, the red twig dogwoods have done well. Um, there's, Blue lobelias, I think, have done pretty well over there. So some have survived, some haven't, but we kind of, you know, planted them in, in mixes so that, you know, we can kind of test out which worked and which didn't. Here's the list of actually what was planted. And again, I can provide anybody with this, this slide, but here's got the number of ones we have. So we have from asters, summer sweets, grasses, uh, Joe Pieweed, and I actually have pictures of the plants as well. So it's not only attractive, um, ours is a little overgrown today, but um, can be an attractive garden. Uh, but also meeting a need to, to filter out the stormwater as well. So here's some of the asters that are out there, uh, the summer sweet plants, some of the grasses, Joe Pieweed, has seemed to, that one seems to have done pretty well out there. Yeah, you can't kill it. Uh, blue lobelia, red twig dogwood, that one really seems to have done well. Um, and then we did some of the, the trees up on the top on the berm area around the outside instead of in the garden itself. Cone flowers. Well, that's a good point. A lot of trees do. River birch, unlike white birch, is a much tougher tree. And they do grow relatively quickly. They'll get to like 80 feet but they're a tough tree and you can't kill them. But it's a good point, usually fast growing in <clears throat> week. And then the red maple, which is the town tree based on the bicentennial. Uh, the switchgrasses, which seem to do especially well out there. Uh, the witch hazel, as Bruce had said. 
and then this breaks down our, our costs. And again, you know, we had a lot of money into, um, you know, into it. We had the highway labor, uh, but this was through a grant through the Stormwater Coalition to get this done and to show this goes together. But um, based on all those plants, um, you know, over 800 plants and everything else, um, it came to just under $30,000, but this was grant funded for that. So some of the maintenance requirements, um, they're designed to be uh, low maintenance. The first year we had to do some weeding out there as the weeds kind of popped up. Uh, we've had some issues with uh, Japanese knotweed that is coming out of the swamp that seems to kind of keep trying to come over the hillside. Uh, so we've had to kind of, you know, hack that back a little bit. Um, that's become a little overgrown from that. Um, you know, say some, the first year some of the plants uh, did better than the others. Uh, we went back and did some pruning and mulching. I think it needs a little bit of pruning and mulching. Uh, now it's gotten a little overgrown, uh, but I say it's done quite well. I did bring, yes, sir. So, so that, you're going down a road here, which is very interesting because it seems to me that you have, I mean, if you, if you plot your maintenance, if you did it right, I think what you're su suggesting is if you do it right, then your maintenance goes down over time yeah. until it becomes, except for, except for, except for the uh, rear area. Uh, your, the rest of it should be maintenance free. I mean, right, right now, I mean, over time, I guess you would watch the infiltration rate. Right now, actually, I think our, our rain garden's infiltrating too fast, in my opinion. Um, technically, it should take 24 hours to percolate in and run out. Um, I've gone over there after storm events, and it only takes a couple hours to run through. So I think it's, I think our, our material is a little more porous than I had estimated in my calculations. But I think that's a good thing, is, is it silts in, and over time, as more stuff goes into it, it, it decreases down. Um, the first year, yeah, we went out there and uh, pruned it, we weeded it, and as the plants have grown, um, I don't have a slide showing the, the, the latest pictures of it, but there are some on the back. I mean, it's fully grown now. Um, there's plants, trees, hardly any maintenance goes into it at all now. I think once a year they go out there and clean out the sediment. Um, and then Jeff is standing in front of I did go out there, I think it was last summer, did a, a little grab. Highway Garage was doing some construction when they were changing out the, the uh, uh, fuel islands, so they were stirring up a lot of area. We had some rains after that, so I figured it was a good opportunity to go out there and do a little water grab. So I went to that pipe we saw at the beginning at the, at the front end, just grabbed a, a water bottle, collected that at the front end. It came out pretty brown and murky, and then said, okay, let's let it run through. So I let it run through for the rest of that day, and then Jeff's kind of holding them up in the back to show the difference visually uh, between the one in his left hand, your right, the, the, the dark brown is what was coming into the rain garden, and then the left side was, you know, visually uh, what was coming back out of it. So I went to the catch basin, popped the cover, and then collected the water that was coming back out at the other end. The, the somebody I think rubbed off the. They both they both say do not drink, and I'm not going to drink either. They've been sitting on my desk for years, so I wouldn't drink either one. And, it, it, it cleaned it quite well, and it's clear, but I, again, I just don't think I'm drinking it. Oh, okay. Um, but the one on the right actually is water that was coming out of the rain garden right. as well. It's so, clear, the clear one. Yeah, they both said do not drink at one point in time. I think okay. the, the drink oh, and the well, do not drink got... <laughs> Our safety coordinator recommended that as they were sitting on my desk in my office, and we've taken them to other different presentations to put a do not drink on both of them. So okay. oh. I'll have to resharpie those a little bit and, and to clear those up. So. Um, as Bruce had alluded to earlier, I think it would be a great study for, you know, RIT or, you know, a biology group to go out there and, and to do some chemical tests and see what the difference is. Are we really taking out the heavy metals? Are we taking out the potassium, nitrogen, you know, the phosphorus, uh, the stuff that, you know, in the, the water? I purely did it just as, as before our last presentation just to kind of see a visual impact of what's it doing. It actually is, you know, filtering through, and so at least there's a visual difference to it, but I don't know chemically how much changed it is. What? Yeah, they're being taken out of the water, but they're not being processed by the plants, are they? No, some so of the some of the mulch. The rain, they're mulch. in the rain garden itself. Yeah, the, the mulch absorbs some of them. The plants the plants soak up the phosphorus and and. Uh, so some of the stuff is processed by the plants. Yeah. yeah. But it's all in there, right? I mean. Yeah. yeah. It's all in there. It's in the rain garden. I mean, it's in the garden. It's in the yeah, plants. Like things like phosphorus and nitrogen, the plants are using actually to live and okay. grow. Okay. So right. they are physically. Right. Using that. Okay, so it is actually being recycled. Yeah. Okay. But not the heavy metals. But some of the heavy metals have probably absorbed. 
Yeah, I, I can't. I'm sorry, Mark. No, that's okay. I said they'd be absorbed into the mulch. At some point, if we'd have to collect those, we would have to dispose of it. If we had to renew, renew the garden, they'd be collected by that, okay. that top layer. So, so that would be the future maintenance. If you see the, the percolation rate go down, if we see the pond overtopping after every storm. Um, and that's, yeah, there is not. <laughs> that's, that's why I, I think it'd be, you know, I'm hoping to, you know, to get a, an RIT grad or some local college that, you know, some biology major that would love to. You're, you're only assuming that there are heavy metals going in and being absorbed. But you, at this point in time, basically don't know. I don't know definitively, but I do know, I mean, it's picking up the fuel islands. So I know there's diesel, there's gasoline. I know there's hydraulic fluid. I know there's salts. Um, you know, but I know that's... Let's say in a resi if that were in a residential area, mm -hmm. in a golf course or something, would you expect... I wouldn't expect as many heavy metals in a golf course, but a golf course, you're going to have a lot more fertilizers. You're right. going to have, you know, they're going to put the phosphorus and nitrogen down and a lot of the other stuff to, oh, yeah. to, to boost the grasses. So you're going to pick up that end of it. Um, just think in a municipal parking lot, you know, you get a lot of heavy metals come off of trucks. You got rust. You have people do metal. We have drop-off that people bring their metals to the you know, the highway garage, we have a lot of disposal. Um, we just had, you know, cleanup day, so people are bringing hazardous chemicals, paints and stuff, hopefully not spilling them on the ground, but um, there is potential for some of that stuff to drip off and, and get washed down this way. So uh, just, you know, one option, um, but, you know, it'd be great if somebody could evaluate that and, you know, do some actual testing on it. I just did it merely as just a, a quick grab just to kind of see if there was a visual difference to that. But. It was important to look at stormwater not within the, only within the municipal boundaries, but to look at it in the watershed boundaries, uh, because those are you know water travels across towns through villages. You've got different entities that are involved with the water. Our water runs onto a county highway, which may end it send the water to the state highway, which eventually gives it back to us. So it's crossing boundaries, and each agency has to address it for the quality as well as quantity. Stormwater Coalition brings all those people together so that we can actually start looking at this as a watershed-based approach. The map on the screen here is the watersheds within the town of Penfield that uh, we have done various studies on. Um, the shipbuilders, Mill Creek, Four Mile Creek, run through Webster into Lake Ontario. Uh, the rest of them actually head south or uh, west into Rondequoit Creek and Rondequoit Bay. In fact, Commission Ditch actually flows south into White Brook and Thomas Creek. So it kind of makes this big circle as it, as it goes, heads towards Rondequoit Bay. As part of the stormwater regulations that we're dealing with, the DEC has designated certain water bodies as stressed, impaired, or um, threatened. And uh, they do an, an analysis on an annual basis Huh? Oh, sorry? Sure. The, uh, these are all listed on what they call the 303D list, which is available on the DEC's website. But they're all ones that are, have some uh, impairments. Impairments may be um, phosphorus, uh, nitrogen, may even just be sediment from construction as well as agricultural activities. So some of the worst ones are, are up in Greece that have done some uh, studies on, the, the, the county is actually going through a very intense study to look at all these watersheds and recommend uh, various improvements that can be done within each watershed. So managing this, this issue, the watersheds and our stormwater, yes sir? Are they, are they part of the natural watershed, do we still have any native trout? There are trout streams, Allen's Creek is considered a trout stream. That I couldn't answer. I'm not a fisherman, obviously. Uh, managing this issue. Uh, again, we're looking at stormwater quality as well as quantity. Uh, quantity, we're trying to prevent flooding of downstream properties because of a runoff. Obviously, w water running off a of grass goes slowly and it gets soaked back into the ground. When it hits asphalt or a house, it runs off quickly can't have an opportunity to absorb and therefore we got to treat it in the many ponds we have. So the town's got about 160 some odd different facilities that controls runoff, whether it's ponds, dry ponds, 
or some of the things that, that Bruce was talking about. Mechanical cleaning are these giant manholes that have screens to help keep solids out. So green infrastructure has become a very important part of our management of our stormwater facilities. What we're trying to do and what the DEC is telling us to do is to, make, is to get the water back into the ground, recharge it, let natural processes filter it, and then there's less to have to store in these giant ponds and hopefully save money for new developments. This is uh, pervious pavers. They have very large gaps in between the joints to allow water to infiltrate. It has a stone base. So that stone base becomes a reservoir for storing that, that water. Again, it's a filtration process. Yes, sir? How do you keep that free of weed? Uh, it's a very thick stone base. He asked how to keep it free of weeds. Uh, as it's, it's a very thick base and it's just stone, uh, so it, seeds won't typically grow. In, and, as, and at times you're going to have to go in. As these things fill with sediment over time, whether it's dust, it gets vacuumed. There's, there's a, anything you put in the ground or everything you build requires some level of maintenance. But these joints are pretty large and they've been very uh, worked well as far as when they vacuum, they can suck the sediments out of it. Um, green infrastructure can actually be indoors as well as outdoors. This is a local engineering firm that has a green wall in their office. Um, what they're finding is it certainly helps pick up the carbon dioxide, but it also has a very calming influence with the people who enjoy the, just seeing it. And it's, uh, it's a live wall. And it's watered from the, the roof runoff is collected, and they're recycling that water back to the plants. Again, that's just another view of it. Uh, the gentleman standing there was the uh, landscape architect that was involved with that project. And he's there, he's just showing us some of the wa how the watering system works from a, a closet nearby, but it, is, it does use it. Um, if you've ever been downtown, the Civic Center Plaza garage is underneath that area. It was a large mass of stone and not, not very much uh, things to encourage people to hang out. The county was able to get some funding to put in a green roof, uh, and uh, now it makes this a pervious surface that is, can filter the, the, the runoff. The material in most of the beds is, is a sedum. It's very low growing, it's low maintenance, and it soaks up water like crazy. Here's where we pulled back the, the bed of sedum, and underneath is that same engineering soil that Bruce was talking about, a very porous mixture that uh, helps hold up, hold water. So they used different grasses and different berms of the sedum throughout. Uh, there was a challenging project for the county because, because it's a courtroom and uh, police headquarters, they didn't want people hiding behind things. <laughs> the police wanted line of sight, so uh, there was a quite a bit of give and take to get uh, this project underway. And as you see, they did some beautiful walkways as well. Even here in the town of Penfield, we use a rain garden in our Dolomite Lodge just back here. Um, we've had a number of workshops on using rain barrels. We help, you can usually get the materials. The barrels are actually the uh, flavors from Genesee Brewing as they make wine coolers. They have no use for them, so we've repurposed them as, as rain barrels. And this was uh, uh, our Phyllis Ely is a town employee, a fantastic artist. So she did, gave it her own personal touch. But again, this water can now be reused. There's a spigot at the bottom, and it can be reused for, for, for watering plants. Uh, Buckman Creek in the town of Brighton. This was a, another project funded through the Stormwater Coalition, where a stream was uh, revegetated, rebuilt to be more natural. Uh, some native species were brought in. They hold the soil together. They control the erosion. Uh, Mike Guyon, who's on our watershed management committee, is in the back, and he's the town engineer for Brighton. So if anybody has any questions, we've got a perfect resource for this. But this was a nice project of taking what used to look like that and to make it a, more of a living creek with, uh, with plants and rocks to aerate and create a better environment. And as you can see, when we made a tour, it was... It was a very robust uh, growth in that area. And that's some of the facilities. Uh, this is at RIT. When a 
big addition was done by where the buses come in at RIT. They did a number of uh, large-scale uh, bio-infiltration swales. And, that, and I think what was amazing for me when I went to see this is it's very aesthetic. I think it's a, it looks like a garden. It doesn't look like someone trying to dig a, a deep ditch, hold water, and then you've got to deal with issues of algae, smell, or other problems. So as you can see, they have a number of them in here. They use some stone, some different landscaping materials. Worked out very well throughout the parking lot. And the water is able to run off, as like Mark said, especially parking garages, because you're parking areas, because you got uh, uh, the stuff that comes off of cars, the oils. This is a great opportunity to have it uptake into plants and process it in the area. So I promised you some these are all on RIT's campus. If you go around the back, you can see these. They're really easy to see from the Loop Road. Fabulous project. And this is another area that's a bioretention area put in, left, they've left the trees, and it can, again, absorb uh, sediments and pollutants. Uh, they have pervious concrete at RIT. There's the brick pavers, and you also have this piece in the middle is the concrete. It looks like popcorn, very large gaps, and it can infiltrate water through it treat it into the, store it in the stone below, and then it gets recycled into the uh, ground. So that's another view of that. All right, here's a rain garden. Uh, and these, again, were funded through the Stormwater Coalition. They've done a number of demonstration projects because it's always difficult to convince people that what we're talking about is real, practical, and it will look nice. Um, but this is just a small depression in front of a house. They used very... Uh, native species that love to have be in water for a while. Um, but I, I think it's very attractive. Is this in Brighton, Mike, or are these, do you recall? Could be what we did as part of the last education program where we built rain gardens in the Buckland Creek watershed? Yeah, this is in the Buckland Creek watershed also, where, where they've done a number of demonstration projects of, of rain gardens. So I think it looks pretty nice. What are the plants in there? What plants the, are in there? The plant species I'm not aware of, but I guess Bruce, do you have a oh, wow. some of them, sure. Uh, purple coneflower. Purple coneflower. It looks like some type of native Rubeckia, the yellow flower. Um, I see what might be Verona castrum, but I can't be sure. Um, mostly coneflowers that I see in that. Yeah. There are several resources online that you can look up uh, what species work well because obviously you want them to, to, take, to like being wet for a, a few hours as well as live in a somewhat dry, dry time. No other examples, it looks like. And then even the village of Pittsburgh did a pervious concrete parking garage behind their facility. Yes, ma'am. So on. those rain gardens that we just saw, did they make these layers with the, um, the stone and the and special mulch. soil and the mulch? Did they go through that whole process, or did they just plant these plants? No, it's, 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 it's a depression, and they put in the, the engineered soil. That's the critical component to make it work. You can't just put regular dirt back in. Yeah. Not Mike Guyan said that they didn't install the under drain. So, so people that own homes, we don't have to try to hook up with a drain to the sewer for the water that's coming through. We can just do the other steps to collect the water and let it just seep into the earth yeah. without having to go through a tube. Typically what these homes did is they, where the downspouts are, they disconnected them from the storm sewer system, extend them out in the yard, and let that collect the runoff. So then you have a pretty steady source of, of runoff. Plus you're getting it, you know, the, the most focused flows you're going to have in a, in a house. That's just a close-up. You can kind of see the, the gaps. It's a very dry cement mix. It's, it's net, you can't trowel it in like a normal concrete slab. They have to kind of roll it in like a rolling pin. It's like making dough. Yeah, you, know, you don't want the dough to get too compact. You've got to make sure it rises. So. This is a challenge for many concrete uh, construction workers. 
So that was the end of my, my topic. I don't know if Bruce wanted to follow up or talk about plants. It seems plants seems to certainly be an interesting topic. I don't, I don't know if we want to take questions now. If we want can to do questions and ask answers questions. as well. We do so have please a, take the microphone, whether from Mark or myself. We do have a, you're going to be a video on TV, as well. We're going to make you all stars. <laughs> uh, we also have a video, if you want to watch the video of, of our rain garden and, and the functionality of that, you can see it uh, during a rainstorm. Uh, we can roll that as well if, if the group would like that and hold questions to the end. Okay. Uh, Brian and Dave, if you have that video, please. So, so people that own homes, we don't have to try to hook up with a drain to the sewer for the water that's coming through. We can just do the other steps to collect the water and let it just seep into the earth yeah. without having to go through a tube. Typically what these homes did is you, they, where the downspouts are, they disconnected them from the storm sewer system, extend them out in the yard, and let that collect the runoff. So then you have a pretty steady source of, of runoff. Plus you're getting it, you know, the, the most focused flows you're going to have in a, in a house. That's just a close-up. You can kind of see the, the gaps. It's a very dry cement mix. It's, it's not, you can't trowel it in like a normal concrete slab. They have to kind of roll it in like a rolling pin. It's like making dough. You, know, you don't want the dough to get too compact. You've got to make sure it rises. So This is a challenge for many concrete uh, construction workers. So that was the end of my, my topic. I don't know if Bruce wanted to follow up or talk about plants. It seems plants seems to certainly be an interesting topic. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if we want to take questions now. If we we can do questions and answers questions. as well. We do so have please a take the microphone, whether from <coughs> Mark or myself. We do have a, you're gonna a, be a video TV, as well. We're going to make you all stars. <laughs> uh, we also have a video. If you want to watch the video of, of our rain garden and, and the functionality of that, you can see it. Uh, during a rainstorm, uh, we can roll that as well if, if the group would like that and hold questions to the end. In 2007, the Stormwater Coalition of Monroe County received a grant to construct a botanical rain garden. This feature is designed to absorb rainwater runoff from roofs, driveways, and walkways, helping to remove the pollutants contained within stormwater runoff. The Town of Penfield applied for grant funding from the Stormwater Coalition to design, coordinate, and construct a rain garden at the town's highway facility. This program will explain the concept, importance, and construction process of a botanical rain garden. What we were looking to do is basically create an artificial wetlands. It's a, a rain garden or a bioretention swale is designed to be able to um, filter surface water, rainwater coming off of buildings, rainwater coming off of parking lots, and be able to filter the water uh, before it goes back into the natural wetlands, which is just beyond the berm in the back over there. The idea behind it is uh, when it rains and uh, water runs off the parking lots, you take all sorts of impurities like antifreeze leaks and oil leaks and salt from um, snow removal in the winter, and you have all these impurities, and what's been happening traditionally is they run into storm sewers and then they run into our lakes or rivers. The idea behind this is to be able to run that water through an area like this of natural plantings that will filter the water as it runs down through the plantings and then as it discharges back at the far end of this of this particular rain garden it'll discharge a lot purer than how it came in and the process behind this is uh, there are a series of, of levels of soil and sand mixes typically in these this particular rain garden has French drains around the edges uh, which are pipe wrapped in stone and fabric so when water perks down through the pipes catch the water and run it back out but the main purpose of this garden in particular when you're running water in here is for the water to kind of flow through the plantings and the plantings obviously as I said will will um, remove impurities from the water as it flows through here then continues back out either in a large deluge out the catch basin at the far end or in this normal rain situations perking down into the French drains on both sides. The plantings that we're using in here are um, a series of native plantings to this area, plants that, this is a tough situation because you want to be able to put plants in there that will um, 
will be able to take a periodic deluge of water and literally be underwater and also be able to take drought conditions. So you're using particular plants that can handle both those conditions. Um, the plants that we use in here, again, are a lot of native plants, witch hazels, summer sweets, red twig dogwoods uh, for the shrubs. We have some nat native grasses. One is called switchgrass in here. And then perennials such as aster, uh, uh, Joe pie weed, uh, Rubecchia, black eyed Susan, um, uh, blue lobelia. These are all plants that grow in water type environments but will also withstand drought conditions. So the, we wanted to be able to make this a very practical thing. It, it's, it is a rain garden. It is made to be able to take this water and filter it. But on another scale, uh, sense of the scales, we wanted to make it kind of interesting to look at. So the way we designed the plantings in there was to create these sweeps of various textures and palettes and colors of plants so that it becomes almost like an abstract painting. And it's going to take probably two years. I would say summer of 09. It's really going to show what, it, what its potential is as far as visual. Uh, with the sweeps of the summer sweets and the red twig dogwoods and the, um, and the, um, the uh, witch hazels sticking up fairly high and then these various levels of perennials, Joe pie weed, three to four feet high, grasses four feet high, some perennials that stay a little lower, you'll have this mixture of textures and colors throughout the garden that again will add some visual interest as well. And what's really neat about this garden is we can look at it almost down on it. A lot of these gardens um, or a lot of these, these bioretention swales tend to be sitting lower than the surrounding grade, obviously, but a lot of times they have cattails and various things growing around them. The beauty of this one and the way it's designed is that we can really get up high on this and not have all that veg vegetation around that's going to kind of take away from the view of it and actually see the various textures and colors throughout the garden. So come back in 09 and you'll see uh, something pretty nice. The town of Penfield uh, applied for a rain garden, a variety of different municipalities applied for this and uh, we evaluated the sites based on how feasible they were for a rain garden. Uh, we selected two sites, one of being the town of Penfield. Rain gardens are a good substitute to traditional stormwater treatment practices such as stormwater ponds. Stormwater ponds are designed to hold water and allow pollutants to settle out or to be treated by microbes and plant material in the pond. Uh, however, a lot of times they can cause complaints from nearby residents with things like algae, concerns over mosquito, mosquito populations, diseases, aesthetic issues. Rain gardens are a great alternative because they effectively treat and clean stormwater, but they're they're attractive to look at. These rain gardens tend to be low maintenance after the first three years once they get established. It's just a matter of weeding them and making sure that woody vegetation uh, doesn't get in and take over. But once they've been established, uh, generally they tend to maintain themselves. Unlike stormwater ponds, which require regular dredging, uh, removal of trash, and again, are a source of complaints from residents. Here we are at the Town of Penfield DPW department, uh, looking at the future site of the rain garden In this type of design, there are many types of rain garden designs. In this design in particular, there are three under drains uh, that are being put in to help drain the property and ensure that the root mass of the plants uh, do not get subjected to uh, too much water and have the rotting of the roots. Uh, the stone here is seen as is what is encasing the perforated under drain. So as the water fills up on top of this, uh, we'll add another little stone layer and then on top of that goes the leaf mulch and topsoil and sand engineered media and through that the, the plants go on top and then once it infiltrates through that engineered media it filters down through uh, it'll hit these stone areas which then goes down to the under drain and then it can drain out the subgrade and drain out the root, root base of the plants. They're actually digging in an area that used to be a fill area for the DPW back in the 60s and 70s, an area when 
uh, the ecology wasn't quite the same and, and people didn't quite have the same concerns about dumping so close to a wetland. Uh, this is a wetland buffer area. Uh, we have received the permits from the DEC to be installing this rain garden within this area. Uh, but I think this is showing a great uh, reclamation of a property that was basically full of, of concrete slabs, gutters, sidewalks, other areas to basically rehabbing it to be a, a functional rain garden, an area that's treating the water quality, um, not hindering it. Uh, in this catch basin, this is the main discharge of the rain garden area. You can see the header pipe coming in closest to us. Uh, this is the 12-inch pipe that the under drains are connected to and it'll also allow the future expansion. Uh, the small pipe on the right-hand side is one of the under drains uh, encased. It's a perforated six-inch pipe that's encased in uh, washed stone that helps to drain the, the basin. And on the opposite side, you can see the discharge going to uh, off to the thousand acre swamp and goes into the to the wetland area. This catch basin will have some risers put on it uh, where we actually end up with a frame and grate that is six inches above the finished grade. This allows for six inches of treatment volume throughout the rain garden. This was part of the original design. The size of the rain garden was sized based on the overall drainage area that's coming to this, the impervious coverage area. Uh, it's picking up a fuel island area, it's picking up some of the highway entrance area, and it's picking up the new sewer building, which you can see in the distance. Here we can see the Town of Penfield Highway Department backfilling the rain garden area. This is a mix of soil of sand, topsoil, and leaf mulch. Uh, we received a shipment of 200 yards of leaf mulch from the city of Rochester as part of this project and they took it in the yard, combined all three materials together, mixed them up and have been dumping material into the rain garden basin and now they're spreading it out, getting a, uh, the first layer of the material established. Um, kind of doing this in, in short lifts here. Uh, I believe we have about 12 to 18 inches of material in there already and I think we'll end up with about uh, 18 inches to two feet in total uh, once completed. So should have a couple more deliveries of the engineered soil material and then spreading it out, uh, getting it ready for the planting bed uh, to come shortly. The concept of a rain garden or a bioretention swale uh, it, to me, uh, and it's not just because I design plants and I do planting for a living, but that the process, the, the principle of this situation is to me is such a no-brainer. A, a good example of what a wetlands does, if they did not continue to dredge out the outlet of the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico and take all those wetlands away, the, the storm surge from Katrina would have been significantly less and, and, and New Orleans and, and all those areas around that had suffered from storm surges would have had a much, much less damage. And wetlands are extremely important not only for that to be able to protect coastal areas but in areas like this to actually filter and keep our water clean. That's why towns are so particular and you can't build in wetlands and you have to, if you're going to get into a wetland, you have to reconstruct one somewhere else. Developers are so used to raising a site, knocking every tree on the site down, filling it in, putting catch basins in, putting their big 12 inch, 24 inch pipe in, running their pipes off to the storm sewers and letting them run off into wherever they go, whether it's the lakes, the rivers, treatment plants or whatever the case may be. If they took that same situation and took say in a development of 40 houses, take one lot, they take that lot they turn it into something like this. They take all the drainage situations anywhere it comes. They can either pipe it to this area or you can literally along roadsides do swales that are planted and you have a series of check dams in them and the water flows off the roads and through this series of dams, check dams and plantings is slowed down, less erosion, it gradually filters back in and it filters back into our groundwater rather than sending it off to the lake. If this process had been embraced by developers and towns, Towns have to be the ones to make the developers do it. In my opinion, what I do here at the town, I've told 
everybody I've dealt with at the town, no builder is going to walk away from building here no matter what we tell them to do. So if you just tell them, look, this is what we want here, this is how it's going to have to be built, they can build it. Now you take that development of 30 or 40 houses and you steal this one lot that they can't put their $300,000 home in and you add $10,000 to each house because they have something that's natural and they're doing good for the environment. I guarantee they'll sell the houses probably faster than they would have sold them if it was just a blacktop jungle. So to me, it's a no-brainer. And I, I play off on, on that mindset that, you know, Years ago when houses were built, many houses in this area have septic systems, right? Everybody has a septic system. And then civilization came down their street and they put sewers in. Now we're all going back to the concept of septic system because rather than taking all that, um, all that uh, sanitary waste and running it to the treatment plants, you, you run it to the holding tank and then you have the fluids that go back out and again are, are filtered through the stone and the soil come, that are in the yard and in the septic system and you're bringing it back to the aquifer rather than just sending it off somewhere else. Um, in big cities, storm sewers and sanitary sewers run to treatment plants. And what happens when they have a big, big storm, the treatment plants can't handle it. So what they do is they open the floodgates and they let all the sewage, way, the sewage and the, sanit the sanitary and the storm sewers run out into the rivers. So they're literally running half a million toilets into the Hudson River, which I, I don't get. Now, the, New York City is a different animal because it's already developed and it's built up. And it's difficult to do things like this in a city like that. But in towns like this that are devel gradually developing, to, to, to tell a developer that this is what they need to do and they have no choice in the matter or they can go build somewhere else, I think most developers will embrace this. And when they finally see that, well, it's going to cost less money to do this than to do all that storm sewer work and all that culvert work, I mean, to me, they'll start embracing the concept of, of doing the right thing. Um, the green movement is really, really big right now. Lead, lead certification on buildings and all these things. A lot of people are jumping on the bandwagon because it's good marketing. It's good. They're, they're lead certified or they're doing things green. And you can see how, just in the last couple of years, how this whole green development has really, really come up. And be the first on your block. Be the first on your block to do stuff like this. Start showing people that it can be done at not a big cost. Developers will start to embrace it. You'll have a much better living environment. To learn more information and guidelines about a botanical rain garden, visit the following websites. For all information on stormwater treatment, visit the following websites. I don't know if people have questions at this point. Um, I say Jeff and I and, and Bruce are all available for questions. I'll defer to Bruce on every question about plants, uh, different types and styles. Uh, but I think, you know, for doing things in your neighborhood, or in your own yard. Um, I don't think you need to get into the, the you know, connecting to the storm sewer or doing underdrain stuff like that, but I think adding some, putting some additives into your existing conditions, uh, turning it over, um, putting some mulch in and, and using a lot of the local plants is, is a great way to, to go to one solve an area that's just kind of a low wet spot in your yard. You can't mow it until June or July uh, where you actually can make a garden out of it, make it a, a, a prettier feature, but also you know, do a lot to get recharged back into the ground. Uh, that's kind of the whole focus of rain gardens is to we've kind of come full circle from sending things in pipes as i said down to the pond at the end of the street to now coming back to rain barrels um, i remember my grandparents used to have a cistern and then you know nobody did that anymore and, and collected storm water and, and you know in the off days or dry days then go water your plants with that and that's kind of what we seem to be coming back around to is getting away from kind of what we did is most things kind of go cyclical is you know putting it into a pipe sending it down the street it went to one pond at the end of the street you know we've had a lot of algae blooms uh, we do have articles back there of living next to stormwater ponds that's another feature that jeff talks about annually people move in next to these stormwater ponds and expect it to be lakefront oceanfront beachfront <laughs> property and are surprised to realize that you know they call up and say well it has cattails and it has bugs and it has frogs and it has birds and we go wonderful. That's, it's working exactly as it should. And they're surprised by our answer going, well, no, but it has cattails and it. it has green stuff on top and it doesn't look as beautiful and pretty and, you know, a, a sandy shore as, you know, when I come in. So a lot of our job is education, um, inform the public of what they really are, what the intent is. Uh, and then this is kind of the next step is, is moving towards localized treatment um, on individual properties rather than sending it down the street is, is bringing it back and, you know, having uh, rain guards and individual property. So if you have questions, I think Jeff has a microphone going around. I can hand you mine as well. I have a low spot in my yard between my yard and my neighbors, and I'd like to do this 
with my gutter. How far out from the house should it be? And can you please uh, tell me again, what is the percentage of the different soil types to add together? Um, sorry. Uh, I believe we did a 50% topsoil, 25% sand, and 25% of the, of the leaf mulch. So if you have leaves in your yard, it's just composted leaves. Uh, mix those together, it makes a, uh, one, it gets the organics in there, and two, it kind of make, it lightens the soil, so it's not so heavy. If you have heavy clay soil, a lot of times is the water sits because, of, you know, it's a heavier soil. Obviously, Penfield has a lot of rock. Um, Dolomite is here for a reason. Um, but in order to lighten that soil up, um, as far as, you know, offset from the house, you do want to make sure you have enough pitch that it, it runs it away. You don't want to have it up against your house, uh, creating a, a water issue or a drainage issue in your basement. So as long as you have enough pitch away from the house, a lot of times you can either disconnect downspouts. Currently, our code does require downspouts in residential, new residential areas are connected to the storm sewer and taken out to the street. Uh, that's one thing we're looking at is disconnecting those, getting those back to splash blocks. If you have a splash block off your house or if you live in a subdivision, your, your house is currently connected in with a, a lateral or gutter that goes out to the storm sewer, you could disconnect that and then direct that, you know, just as a leader to that area so it waters it. Um, you know, obviously, in a severe drought, you may need to water it a little bit, uh, but the, the plants are, that are picked are um, both water tolerant and uh, you know, drought tolerant as well. Um, but if you do have specific questions, you're welcome to contact myself or Jeff. Uh, the engineering department is you know, always available to come out and, and provide you know, some basic guidance, take a look at things uh, if you do have some drainage concerns on your property. And one question over here first. Look at this, this lady um, chance. Well, we have our, our, lawn, our yard, our, our property is, is clay. You can actually make pots out of it. So um, getting that soil in there is really important. And I'm just wondering about the cost because it seems to me a pretty major operation to excavate maybe, say, 10 feet by 10 feet even um, and, uh, of this clay and uh, substitute these other materials. So what is that going to, you know, do you have a ballpark on that kind of thing? Um, I, I don't offhand. I mean, obviously, it's depending on what your availability is to some of those materials. Um, you can uh, talk. We do have a lot of landscapers in town. If, if you're mm -hmm. looking to hire it out, um, I would recommend getting, you know, three quotes from, mm -hmm. from somebody. Obviously, you can rent some, you know, small equipment on your own. Uh, you can kind of start off small, you know, do what you can, you know, in a small area. Um, Bruce has done some more residential projects. Um, he's out in the field actually building them. Uh, he may be able to give you some, some ideas, thoughts, or you know, have some better pricing options. So you're thinking about you know, someone coming in to excavate it for you to dig out that area for I'm you, not, you? I'm not excavating it. Well, <laughs> so Somebody's going to have to do it. Okay, just, just to throw out some like, really rough ideas. Okay, so say you were going to excavate an area maybe this size right here, uh. and you want to go down maybe a couple of feet. You can find a local landscaper with a little mini excavator. Uh -huh. You're going to pay them $75 an hour. They might be in there for uh -huh. three or four hours. Uh -huh. So you might spend, by the time you dig it out, haul it out, put something back in, you might spend $1,000 getting it ready, okay. getting all your soil mixed in. Probably the thing you're going to want to do is, and you know, if you're going to pay someone to do it, you want a soil sand mix. If you're going to do it yourself, you buy some sand, you buy some soil, you mm -hmm. mix it up. Right, right. You want my opinion? Pay someone to do it and drink iced tea while they're doing it. <laughs> well, that would certainly because be my hard, preference. It is hard work. Yeah. Now, going back, I just wanted to respond to the downspout question that you had a minute ago. You can go to Home Depot and buy these pop-ups for like 15 bucks. It's a little elbow with a green lid on it. And what we do is we tie them into downspouts, run them away from a house. We can bury the downspout all below the ground. And when it rains, the water pops up and flushes out into your lawn or wherever. And that's a good way to, to do your rain gardens as well, because then you don't have a pipe above ground that might be going where you're trying to mow your lawn. Everything stays kind of below ground, a foot or so below ground. That little pop-up elbows up, and water perks out into your rain garden, and you're good to go. That's a good way to go. You still, you still have to have the, the whatever drains the rain garden. You have to be six inches above whatever fills the rain garden. Well... <laughs> It really depends on what, I mean, if you're taking runoff off of your roof, I don't really think you're going to need to have any kind of mm -hmm. exterior drain or anything like that. Well, actually, in our case, we're in a bit of a dell. So we get runoff from the school, 
um, and, uh, and the hills around us. So, so there are times, you, you remember, the, you know, like last year when we had one of those amazing 100-year rains? Mm -hmm. It's coming off the roof so fast that it never hit the gutters. Went right over it the top. It just <laughs> went right by them. <laughs> so we were looking at it, some, you know, we were looking at an amazing quantities of water coming, you know. My recommendation on a scale of your size is you probably want to have an engineering firm do the calculations of how much, like how much water is, how much watershed is coming to that one area in your property and then how big an area would you need and then do you need to go the step a further we have a drainage ditch that it, goes it sounds through. like you have a natural low area but we have a drainage ditch that goes through yeah so you can feed off of that i mean yeah. you know we kind of created one artificially and that's where that six inches came from we basically created a bathtub because we didn't have one it was already <laughs> filled in, oh, so we're ahead of filled the in the, you're ahead of the game you already have a natural low area, and that's some of the stuff we've talked about, is if you have a kind of a low wet spot, you know, we may all have those areas in your yard that you can't get into until June or July, the grass is always stays wet, it's soft, you can't get back there. You know, this is an alternative to, to do something to treat that, make it more of an attraction of your yard than just something you, you can't mow. Um, we kind of created that six inches artificially uh, just in order to make sure that we ponded the water and had a storage volume and everything else. So we kind of backed into that, but that was just kind of a rule of thumb for the plants so you don't have them three feet underwater and then wonder why your plants are, are drowning. Obviously, they're not, you know, aquatic plants. They're a balance between, yeah, they like to be wet at times and like water, uh, but they can also handle the, the drought. Question. Uh, the town obviously budgeted for the project that you just showed us. Are there any, any plans to do something to the other areas in Penfield? Is that part of your... Um, we did this one as a, as a pilot program. Uh, we have recommended to other developers. Um, we've actually had um, um, the uh, Tim Hortons on 441 uh, just installed the rain garden, the one uh, just east of 250. They've uh, put something in. Uh, Nolan's Party Rental installed the rain garden. So we've you know, kind of led the way and said, hey, we'll put them in. And then as each project comes in, we kind of share what we've done um, and then encourage them to go along. We haven't done any more rain gardens yet. Um, you know, we may. Uh, we've tried to do some other things. They said earlier we're trying to do some solar right now and kind of show how that can be used. Uh, we've done some electric car charging stations. We have one out, out back here. We have one at the community center. So we've kind of tried to touch a little bit on each of the renewable resources, sustainable things. Um, so we haven't really come back around to doing a, a second rain garden yet, but it has seemed to have worked uh, very well to this point and, and done its job. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that would be an ideal place to, to do something like that. The grants from the state are very competitive, mm -hmm. and the Stormwater Coalition is the, the group that goes out and gets them. So a lot of it is they try to do projects, distribute them around the county mm -hmm. so that various communities can showcase them to the residents. So we, we, we do apply from so time to time. Yeah. You know, There's certainly a lot of opportunities to use something like this. You're yes. Welcome. Anybody else have any other questions? Yes. Get you the mic. The town of Penfield always had a big mulch pile up here by the baseball fields. Did you guys move it to somewhere else, or just was that like a one-time big deal? We ran. Uh, we ran out. <laughs> you We're in the process of making new. We ran out. Usually so we you'll have, have it. Uh, you'll have it there uh, in the spring, but uh, we're just in the process of uh, grinding uh, some of the material right now. You gave us a figure on the mulch, what it filtered. Can you s repeat that again? Uh, usually it's a two to three inch layer, enough one that kind of keeps the weeds down. But you said it filtered a certain percentage? Um, uh, it takes out some of the heavy metals and some of the, st the stuff like that. So yeah, the two to three inches of, of the, the mulch, uh, is, as Tony shared, a lot of times we'll have it here in the spring, uh, just in the parking lot uh, off of Columbus Crossing. Uh, it is free if you want to you know, show up, you're, you're welcome to take it. Uh, that comes from all the collection during the year as people drop off tree branches and, and residential stuff, uh, then we do uh, grind it, but obviously there's not unlimited supply, but usually May, June time frame, I think is when we start kind of putting it out there and uh, it is quite a, a big pile, but you put two to three inches, that kind of helps to keep the weeds down, uh, keeps it off the surface, but also um, keeps the soil from eroding away as well, because you'll have that soil underneath 
So one, as the rainfall comes down, it doesn't wash out the soil you have. It kind of helps retain it all together. Uh, and the video is on, uh, I believe it's a YouTube video. So that's up if you wanted to share that with anybody else or, or watch it again. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any other questions this evening. Uh, we'll be here for a few minutes after this, but I think with that, we'll, we'll close this uh, as part of the discussion series.